Hello, uh, welcome to all. On behalf of the International Association of Adolescent Health, my name is Mauricio Scarpello, actual vi Vice President for the Latin American region. And I will be the chair of this second session of a total of four in which we want to stimulate international discussion about the best ways of educating and training professionals to deliver effective health care for young people. We have invited four people to share their ideas and experiences. They will have 15 minutes to present, followed by five minutes for questions. Please type your questions in the question and answer box, and we will endeavor to get through as many as possible. However, if there is insufficient time, we will ask the presenters to respond after the session and we will circulate the answers. We have circulated a program for the session containing a summary of each presentation together with, the, with more details about each uh, presenter. All sessions are being recorded and will be available after the event. Uh, before we start, I would like to invite uh, Professor John Klein. We have a recorded video um, to say a few words about this symposium. Just a few minutes and we'll back. I'm John Klein, the president of the International Association for Adolescent Health. And I am delighted to welcome you to this um, online presentation from our education committee. The International Association for Adolescent Health is providing today's program as part of our over overall commitment to the call to action for adolescent health and well-being. The sessions are happening over the next month, and I hope you'll be able to join this one and some of the others to explore some of the issues in what we really need to do to improve the health care and the training of healthcare care professionals to be able to meet the needs of adolescents in every country for every family and every young person around the world. It's so critical that we improve access to care and that universal health care include the appropriate set of services for young people's needs, whether it's mental health, sexual and reproductive health, or physical health care needs. The training of adolescent health professionals and the workforce that's needed to really improve the health of our populations is a critical part of that equation. And our education committee and many of our members are involved in addressing the standards and guidelines for training around the world. We need those standards. We need adolescent health experts able to help develop and maintain systems of education for primary care as well as for specialty care in every country in order to really improve the services that uh, are needed. So thanks again for being here. Uh, I hope you'll explore some of the other upcoming activities that are being sponsored by IAAH and many other organizations as part of the Partnership for Maternal Child and Newborn Health, or PMNCH's commitment to adolescent health and well being. And uh, let me turn the program back over to uh, our moderators and speakers to move on with today's uh, event. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Now we are going to start with the presentations. The first work, it is called the Patch Teen Educator Program, empowering teens to become involved in their own health care. It will be presented by Erika Kostel. Uh, she's Director of Youth Engagement for Patch, Master in Gender and Women's Studies, and also with with Ellie um, Whitley, Patch Teen Educator. You have 15 minutes for the presentation. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. We are absolutely delighted to be here with you today. Um, and there you should be able to see our PowerPoint. We are just delighted and honored to be here to talk about our Patch Teen Educator Program, where we are really working to empower teens to become more involved in their own healthcare, which involves interacting with healthcare professionals. Um, I am Erica Kepsel. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Patch Director of Youth Engagement. I'm in Wisconsin in the US. 
um, along with Allie. Allie, do you want to come on and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Allie with Lee. My pronouns are she, hers. I'm 16 and I'm a junior that goes to Denmark High School, which is also in Wisconsin. Um, I'm a sterile processing tech in um, one of the hospitals nearby, which is a cool fun fact about me. And I also, thinking back, I've been a part of Patch now for five years and it's just crazy to me, but I love Patch so much and I'm so happy to share what Patch is with all of you. Yay, I'm so happy that you could be here today, Allie. It worked out. Allie is in the middle of a school day, but it's here momentarily to, to chat with us. Um, so we all are in this field of adolescent health. We are here because we want to see adolescent health grow, but I wanted to take a moment um, to kind of set the stage for where Patch falls within this whole adolescent health sphere, which is quite huge, or this field that is quite huge, and what motivates a lot of our programming. So um, we know that adolescence is a critical time when patients are setting the stage for their future healthcare decisions, often deciding, perhaps unconsciously, more so than consciously, during this phase, whether they're going to become smart consumers and engaged consumers of their own healthcare, or if they're not going to do those things. And we know young people are developing important life skills for when they become adults, um, and even now in their adolescence. We also know that, at least in the United States, um, teens are least likely to utilize preventive health care. They're least likely to return for follow-up care, and they're most likely to have a failed patient-provider relationship. And so if youth are, if we're hoping that youth are developing all these skills, those maybe negative experiences or negative associations can really impact the way that they seek care in the future. So our hope at Patch is that we can dig in with youth early so that we can emphasize accessing preventive health services. Um, and better prepare them for that transition to adult healthcare so that it is there for them when they do need it. And Allie, to you. Okay, so one of our past teen educators um, has said this, and it was a really, really inspirational quote, so we kept it so that we could share it with all of you. But managing our own healthcare, like is like driving a car. It's an important part of becoming an adult. At the end of the day, it's just making sure we're physically and mentally well so that we can do so many amazing things in life. So personally for me, um, this kind of means like growing up, you know, we learn to stop relying on our parents to drive us everywhere. We kind of step out into the world and we start doing that ourselves. It's got to be the same way with our healthcare. We can't rely on our parents forever to manage that for us and getting started early. And as adolescents, we're able to better understand both our rights and what we can do to be more involved so that when we do get older and it is 100% on us to manage all of this, we know what we're doing and we're more comfort comfortable and confident about it. Yeah, I love that and feeling comfortable working with a healthcare provider to make that happen. Thank you, Allie. This really, this quote has such a driving force behind our mission at Patch, which is to improve adolescent health and well being alongside and a true partnership with youth. And our vision, where we eventually we want to envision a supportive environment in which all youth are healthy, connected, and thriving, which I think even our intro that like youth across the globe deserve access to care and services um, really aligns well with what you all are doing here. So, we started our work at Patch back in 2010 with our Patch Teen Educator Program, and that's really what I'm going to focus on today because that's where we have the biggest touch points with the healthcare system. This is an in-person program that runs in a variety of communities, and each of those communities ultimately follow a similar program structure. So all of our Teen Educator Program hire a group of 14 to 18-year-olds who are really at the center of our work, and they're, they're hired from that community to be teen educators. These youth are paid for their work and their time, and they are supported by a trusted adult, this patch coordinator, um, who is also hired by an organization hosting the Patch Teen Educator Program. So I have the privilege of working for kind of our patch headquarters, if you will, um, and some of our patch sites are in that, and others are working through other organizations and entities and have, have licensed or replicated our program. Um, this coordinator is supported by Patch via a Patch coach. It's our go-to person who kind of knows all the ins and outs of our programming and can help troubleshoot as things come up or identify adaptations within the community. I, right now, am our coach for all of our replication partners, but we hope as we grow, we're able to bring on more people um, to that fold as well. But then we also really hope they are supported locally by a coordinator support team. Um, this group is really intended to ensure that it is community driven that it is meeting the needs of the community and local teens as well. Um, so with kind of those inputs going towards the work, 
the youth are then delivering workshops with the support of their coordinator to healthcare professionals defined quite broadly um, and fellow young people. And so this work, this kind of output of youth energy, this raising of youth voices is where we're really working to improve adolescent healthcare experiences by prioritizing those youth voices. So I wanna talk a little bit more about those PAPT workshops. I think that'll get you all the most excited. Um, so Ali, can you explain our workshops, maybe starting with the provider one? Yeah, of course. So workshops are basically a, a group of us teen educators will go in and we'll either talk to providers or we'll talk to adolescents, people our age. When we go in and we talk to providers, we do an interactive workshop with them where we teach them about who we are and what we're looking for in healthcare and how to better connect with us. Because one of the biggest things when providing healthcare for teens is that connection. A lot of the time, adolescents, they don't have that connection and it makes them feel very unsafe or uneasy. And then they don't have that good connection that they can be open and honest with their providers. So we teach them how to build those connections and how to better care for us and understand what the realities are like in our lives and how they can better impact the healthcare experiences that we have um, and how the healthcare system in general impacts us and how they can better advocate for the change that happens. Um, as for our teen workshops, we go in to different places and we get to talk to people our age and tell them about what we've learned and how we can empower them and how they can be more inspired to get more involved in their healthcare. And we teach them, you know, knowledge and skills on how to manage their healthcare and teach them the rights that they have. Fun fact, a lot of people my age don't know what confidentiality is. Like they've never heard that word before. It's crazy. So we go in and we teach them what that is. And then a lot of the times they're like, oh, but I can't share this information. Like my parents will find out. But then they're not being safe about their bodies or their health care. So then we teach them that they do have that right to keep a secret and that they have that right between their provider and them unless it's something that's life-threatening to them or someone else. So then we teach them what mandated reporters are and all kinds of different things like that so that they can understand healthcare and they can feel more involved and informed with everything going on so that when they do get to that point where they have to manage their healthcare, they can understand for themselves what they you know, need to know. And then when they have kids later on in the future, they know how to help advocate their advocate for their kids. And they also know how to help get their kids involved in the healthcare system when they're around that age as well. Allie, I couldn't have said it better myself. Phenomenal overview. The only other two things I will add is that we do define provider and healthcare provider quite broadly. So, um, you know, a lot of our examples will take place in typical clinic settings and preventive care visits or annual, annual visits. Um, but we're also, you know, we're talking to doctors, nurses, school nurses, social workers, therapists, um, physical therapists, occupational therapy, like we define adolescent health quite broadly because we know that there is struggle, trouble, trouble accessing care. And so we want youth to feel confident in it with those providers regardless. Um, and we do focus all of our workshops on what we call the three R's, which I know is not, there's many three R's out there, but for R's, their relationship rights and responsibility. And that rights piece is huge for the provider side too, because a lot of providers like will gloss over at once, but teens need reminders. There's a lot from, from Allie and teens when they present talking about why those rights pieces matter. Um, I'm, can I, can I hop in quick? Yeah. So I know that Erica mentioned three R's. I like to tell everyone that there's actually four because I think respect is a huge one. A lot of the times adolescents aren't taken seriously. So it's and it's because they don't know anything. So our job is to go in and teach them those things so that they can understand and they are informed so that they gain that respect. And they are like, I know how to, you know, I know my rights to health care and all of that stuff. So then they gain that respect from their providers. And then they can also respect their providers because there's that mutual relationship that happened. Yes, Ali, I love that. And honestly, our program is really rooted in this respect for youth voice. Um, our model for youth engagement is built around it in many, many ways. So it's a perfect time to jump in. Um, our work, so our work with the model for youth engagement primarily focuses on two different strategies, youth-driven programming and youth adult partnerships. Um, our program structure with this small team of teen educators that have a dedicated adult coordinator who is their go-to person really allows relationships between that group to flourish and helps ensure 
sure they are working together across kind of age gaps to create change. Um, we encourage these coordinators to set a foundation, part of that youth-driven piece. Like we want you to know that there are there are baseline expectations, there are the foundation, um, there are things that they are going to for sure do by their involvement. And we hope that that coordinator is continuing to listen and take in youth feedback and ideas to continually improve the program and drive it forward in ways that best serve the needs of our teen educators. Um, Allie, what's it been like participating in a program that does prioritize this like youth adult partnership, youth driven piece? Honestly, it has been like absolutely amazing. I've loved it so much. And I mean, there's so many benefits that come out of it. First of all, like just knowing how to interact with adults, like that's a huge thing. And we're going in and we're teaching teens how to build these relationships with providers, people who are older than them and know more than them. So getting able or being able to have that relationship and understand how to connect with people already and work side by side with one another I mean, we can totally reflect that then into our workshop so that we can help people understand better um, what we're looking for and stuff like that. Um, and then, I mean, it goes for the same thing with us being youth driven. We're able to better connect and use our experiences and help providers understand what we're looking for instead of another provider trying to, you know, they see what they see and let's go talk to someone else about it and run it. This is like our voice and we're being heard and we're helping people understand what we need in our lives and how to better benefit us and all of that stuff. Love it. Oh, Ali, I love seeing you just as excited. These two pieces are the part of the my job that I love, hence the director of youth engagement piece. Like I love this piece. And so I think Ali and I could talk about just those two strategies <laughs> probably all day and would be happy to if you ever want to connect after. Um, the <laughs> The three activities that we really focus our work around are our three E's, we really like similarly named letters, um, employment, education, and empowerment. And so these program components for employment, it is a job. So youth are, they're going through um, an interview, they're getting paid, they are hired, they are trained and onboarded, um, and they're really hopefully developing these important workforce development skills. Um, they're educated. We make sure that youth learn health-related content, honestly re relevant to their job as teen educators, um, but also that could provide them with information for their own health and well-being, sometimes even about the healthcare field in case they want to go into it and be, be healthcare providers themselves someday. Um, this happens through regular meetings that do often focus on a specific topic that is led by a local content expert or guest speaker, um, who helps connect you to other resources and again expands that field of health and what that means. Um, and then empowerment, this is meaning that you feel like they have the ability to create change and they see the value of their voice. They see providers respecting their voice. They see others in their community doing that, um, which is primarily happens through those workshops for our teen educator programs. And we honestly learned that the combination of the three E's is what creates an experience unlike other jobs or clubs or activities that many youth are part of. Allie, real quickly, because we're running out of time, how has Patch changed the way that you've experienced and interacted with the healthcare system? It's a big question for not a lot of time. <laughs> it is, but I can shorten it up super quick. So basically, um, being a part of Patch, like Erica said, there's that education part to it. So I've definitely learned, like I said, I started Patch five years ago. When I started Patch, I knew like nothing about healthcare personally. And now I'm like, I don't, I just, I know so much. So it's like, I'm totally involved in my healthcare now. And it's just, it's empowered me so much to go out and teach other adolescents the same thing, because I feel that it's an important thing. And I feel that people shouldn't be scared to go see providers. Like they should be confident and comfortable. So being able to make that impact and empower others is what basically has inspired me to be here today and talk to all of you, because I just think Patch is amazing, amazing and being able to understand adolescent health and the fact that all of you are here to do that is awesome. So thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you, Allie. That is that is delightful and so exciting. And yeah, it feels so good to be like, oh, I can do many of these things. The last thing that I really wanna leave you with, so these are right now our Teen Educator Program Application sites. These are people who are taking that program model and using it in their community. And I think while we give a clear structure, we have found that it is so important for this to be community led and owned and responding to the needs and people in the community. Um, this is just a current look at who we have running the program. And the last thing that I want to just kind of briefly run through is that they are each doing things uniquely um, with a unique focus. So our Patch Denver site 
um, is really focused on school-based health centers and connecting the youth in that way. They're also housed out of a healthcare system. Um, Wood County and Saipan or CNMI are all health department run and often, um, and you can see they do alcohol and drug prevention stuff a lot in WOCO, that's their main focus. Um, and Saipan is new, it is an island community and as a US territory was connected through the Title V Maternal Child Health Grants and are really working to you know, meet their unique community needs. Um, in New York, we have a really rural site who is operating within four counties to meet the needs of youth. Um, and then in Buffalo, Hope Buffalo um, is operating in the Buffalo, New York area and is focused in some ways from a community-led initiative. So trying to align adolescent health across programs locally. And both of these operate out of area health education centers. And so they are working on pipeline programs, actually trying to get youth who are part of our program to go into the healthcare field in a really cool way. Um, and then our Wisconsin, we have multiple sites and are working specifically on a statewide initiative. Again, trying to align with other adolescent health measures, honestly, like number of well visits and things like that. But each of these communities still exists with just a team of local youth, a local coordinator who is then making local connections to better represent what is needed at that local level. Um, sorry to run through those last little things. I'll also throw, we have a lot of like wraparound resources and other youth programming if you ever wanna talk more. Um, but I will wrap up my questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very nice to hear all this experience and all this that you share with us. Uh, I have one question here. We have only one, two minute left. So uh, I would like to be quite shortly in the answer. So what if any barriers have you faced uh, with getting adolescents to attend these workshops? Um, so we work through someone who is already coordinating a group of youth for the patch for teens workshops. Um, and so it's somewhere they've already gathered. It might be health school health fairs. It might be, we come to their classrooms and health courses. Um, it might be at library programming or community centers. Um, it is certainly hard to get some youth excited about health. So that is like real. And I think the fact that it is led by youth is really, really helpful. Um, Allie, do you have other tips on how you've gotten youth to things to the patch for teen stuff? Yeah, um, like you had said, I mean, it's it's led by youth, so that already helps kind of get them engaged. But we also do a lot of like fun interactive things with them. So we have we have a few activities that we do during during the workshops where we'll have like an audience member come up and like act out a skit with us or something like that. So it's very interactive with the crowd. We have questions and like we have Q and A's that we do with them. We do all kinds of stuff with them to get them more involved. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for your answer and for sharing with us all your, your experience. And we're going to start now with the second work and the second presentation that it's titled uh, Features of Adolescent Medicine Training in Family Medicine Residents, a scoping review. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Pierre Paul Tellier. He's a family physician working in Montreal, Canada associated with a professor of family medicine at McHill University. All time is yours. Well, good morning, everybody, for me, actually this afternoon. <clears throat> so I'm going to present to you actually a research project that we did for um, essentially assessing the um, understanding of or the kind of training that family medicine residents uh, were getting and should get. Uh, so the title is Features of Adolescent Medicine Training in Family Medicine Residents, a scoping review. There's no conflict of interest that I have to declare. These are the other authors that are uh, involved in this presentation. Um, <clears throat> these Presentation was given also at the annual Amy conference in Lyon last year, as well as the Family Medicine Forum in Toronto. There is a publication of the of the work, and that's in the uh, International Journal of Adolescent Medicine Health. <clears throat> the financial support came from a variety of uh, for this project from a variety of sources. Uh, including the McGill Efmer, which is our education group in uh, the family medicine department. <clears throat> so background, adolescents and young adults aged 10 to 25 years 
are within a distinct and vulnerable developmental period with complex and unique healthcare needs. AYA need to be able to access age-appropriate health care services delivered by physicians who possess the specialized expertise necessary to manage their unique health care needs at an age-appropriate level. Family physicians consider the full life cycle of patients and treat the full spectrum of patients and their family's condition, problems, and diseases. Hence, family physicians appear to be well-suited to caring for adolescent patients. However, the literature suggests that both residents and practicing family physicians report a low perceived self-efficacy, inadequate skills, and feel generally underprepared to care for adolescent patients. So the purpose of our study was to map the range and nature of the literature regarding what is known about adolescent medicine training for family medicine residents. <clears throat> In other words, our review question was, what is known about adolescent medicine training for family medicine residents? Uh, may I underline that we also did a similar uh, quick review for uh, people who are in practice and the findings were similar. So the methods that we used was a scoping review. Uh, we did a scoping review according to the six stage framework from Artsky and O'Malley, further refined by Levac and the Joanna Briggs Institute methodology for scoping reviews. <clears throat> this is the quantitative results. So we identified 1,273 articles. And after um, sort of going through a sorting out process, we came down to a total of 47 articles that we included in our reviews, including uh, 41 from the academic literature and six from the gray literature. This is... Um, bar graph that shows our qualitative results. Uh, the black line is essentially the information that we've gotten from the academic literature. The colored line is from the more um, gray literature, including websites uh, and the like that present uh, competency-based training. And we have divided the different colors according to the competencies. As you can see, the majority of um, findings were about family medicine experts. Um, the, what you see listed here are the CanMeds FM. In other words, the CanMed <clears throat> family medicine in Canada. And uh, the competencies are knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors. So communicator first, communicator, uh, including communication, include communication with other and colleagues. Um, and these were uh, things like managing sexual abuse case, identifying, uh, reporting and referring abuse patients to specialists, communication with patients. So delivering a vaccine recommendation and education to adolescents and their parents, communic communication with chronic disease, self-management, communication about mental health issues, patient communication, contraceptive counseling, communication about eating disorder, counseling families about child development, normal and abnormal. Family medicine expert, wow. Uh, you can see how much there is information here. So there is knowledge, assessment, and management of acute and chronic medical issues. And God forbid I read that whole entire list, but you can see that there's quite a variety of uh, of um items from normal development to um, I, insertion of IUDs to uh, body image. So there's quite a few things that uh, we expect and um, people are expected to know. Knowledge of mental health issues, knowledge of psychiatric disorders, psychopharmacologic agents, suicidal risk assessment and risk and self-harm, Assessment and management of mental health issues, physical illness, psychological factors, assess suicide risk, depression, peer pressure, unspecified, which are health promotion, career choice, LGBT adolescent biological, psychological, and social issues, and child abuse. The others include professional, under which came ethics, uh, so navigate confidentiality, which was mentioned in the other presentation, 
disclosure, confidentiality about HIV AIDS, <clears throat> excuse me, team collaboration, legal duty to report suspect child management and navigate Medicare. Collaborator included collaborating with other health professionals to teach skills for engaging adolescent patient education and counseling and working with healthcare teams. Uh, scholar, there was really nothing much available. The leader was essentially uh, leading and working around group activity for HIV AIDS and health advocates um, was community-based adolescent health education and sexual health counseling. Um, so discussion, there's obviously a large emphasis on the medical role. Not all CanMed FM roles have been studied and presumably taught to family medicine residents. The omission and poor representation of multiple competencies suggests that current training may be highly variable across family medicine residency programs at best and insufficient at worst. So the limitation is the possibility of missing potentially relevant documents, uh, especially those that are not uh, in the academic literature, since with um, the academic literature, what we did do to try to mitigate is we included a librarian to help us with the research uh, team, uh, in the research team to help us do the uh, search. Cultural differences could have inf an influence on the code results of required competency in adolescent medicine as it came um, according to what's described in different countries and what different countries we, um, would describe as being a needed competency. Uh, this is uh, basically because we were looking at academic literature across the board, mostly English and French speaking. Limitations due to the research design used to be in the empirical investigation, which included that were included in the review, and these were mostly cross section. My dogs are barking. Takeaways authoritative organizations such as accreditation bodies should investigate the competency role discrepancies in the adolescent medicine curriculum for family medicine residents. Researchers can optimize the curriculum by exploring underrepresented competencies, including leader, health advocate, scholar, and collaborator. So if you want to do some research, these are the area where you might want to research. The combined efforts of academics and family medicine education stakeholders to address competency gaps may positively, be, positively impact the competence reported by family medicine residents in adolescent medicine, and ultimately this may result in enhanced quality of care and adolescent outcomes. So these are our references, and thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Pierre Paul. Very nice your presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions here for you. Uh, the first one it is: uh, What's the level of interest that family uh, medicine residents uh, have for adolescent medical training? The interesting part is that across Canada, as well as in many places around the world, um, the majority of physicians that are available to see the residents, uh, I mean, sorry, to see family adolescents from primary care perspective, um, that is from their first presentation to even in some environment area where it's remote is uh, where they offer often specialized care is very marked because they often find themselves alone within either the community that is remote or rural or they find themselves diff having difficulty reaching a specialty service that is located in a larger center. So they often find that they have to offer um, this care. Now, the adolescent medicine group is not necessarily the group that accesses the most frequently our um, clinics and, and, and us, essentially, to access care but when they're there, uh, we need to be able to communicate with them in a manner that is um, welcoming and which will allow us to gather information. So it's important that we treat, we teach our residents to be able to do that. Perfect. Okay, thank you. And the other question is, 
How are these results uh, currently being used to influence curriculum design in Canada, for example? Well, it's very interesting because we happen to be in a transition period right now in Canada. M many of you probably do not know in Canada is two year, was two years and still is two years, but will be over the next four years now at this point, uh, transitioning to a three-year program. So we hope that this will be used to introduce more um, compulsory education about adolescent health within the three-year program. Granted, um, the residents, if they want to do uh, elective, can do electives. Uh, usually these electives are done in a hospital, which is a specialty hospital, uh, which uh, offers around specialized care, for example, often things around um, eating disorders. But there's very few settings where primary care um, approaches are taught and the issues around primary care, such as STIs, uh, contraception, uh, depression, things of these natures that will present to us as primary care physicians. Um, so we need to be able to educate them around these topics. Um, the argument has long been that they learn these other things um, when they doing their other rotations, but we do need to explain to the people who are developing curriculums that being able to address the adolescent needs a special skill and um, a special approach that is different than addressing an adult, for example. Thank you very much for, for your answer. And I think uh, we don't have any more questions. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pierre. Now we are going to move on with the next presentation. Thank you. Uh, I we need to stop sharing. Thank you. Okay, so now we will start with this third uh, presentation that is called Approach to Adolescents in Office Practice. It will be presented by Dr. Nishal Bahet, a consultant pediatrician in Ahmedabad, uh, specializing in teenagers' health, chair of the Adolescent Health Academy Ahmedabad, creator of Parent Teens, a workshop for parents and teenagers to empower them to live, live life powerfully. Doctor, you can start. Sure, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm very, very happy that the International Adolescent uh, Association of Adolescent Health has created this innovative idea of joining all together. So really, thank you so much. And the coordinators have really worked very well. Uh, see, adolescents are a powerhouse of human potential. They can be a critical agent of change if they are allowed to be part of the conversation in a fundamental way. So we must engage and empower adolescents because it will give us triple dividend. Adolescent now, their future lives, the next generation. So an urgent call of action is required. Now, first of all, why this topic? Because, see, we, have, we know that there are 1.8 billion youth, which is the age group of between 10 to 25. So every sixth individual walking on this earth is of this age group. Second, in India, it is 21%. That is 253 million youth is there. So every fifth Indian is in the age group of 10 to 25. So demography of India suggests that we must take care of adolescents. Now, during the curriculum of MBBS and post-graduation of pediatrics and all other med medicines, we usually taught to take care of the children till 12 years, whereas the internal medicine people are taught to take care of the children, uh, adults from 18 onwards. So the adolescent fall into a no man's land zone that at 12 to 18, a very critical age, is not been taken care of uh, uh, very well in India because of this curriculum issues. Second, routine pediatric OPDs are very heavy. So it is very difficult to take care of any adolescent during the pediatric office practice. So what we have thought of since almost 10 years that we must create some 
to the point point so that we can take care of this adolescent in our busy office practice now what are the innovations that we i have done to impart this knowledge to busy practicing pediatrician we have created a module which is taken uh, in front of these pediatricians those who are in the practice for 5 years or 10 years or so and it is going to be a kind of workshop setup so there is a difference between a child learns in the school whereas an adult learn in this kind of workshop set is set up because adult adult learning is involved with active participation when they learn when they contribute very powerfully if humor is involved they are been taken into the participation of this active learning there are various learners in this there are visual learners auditory learners kinesthetic learners so visual learners need to have this audio audio visual part into any learning process the auditory learner will need to listen many things whereas kinesthetic learner need to move from one place to another while learning so if all these things are involved into a adult learning facility adult learning workshop kind of role plays meditation visualization storytelling and then it becomes very easy for them to learn very powerfully so what we have done is we have created this kind of uh, activities and it can be uh, learned very well so the indian academy of pediatrics and its sub specialty chapter adolescent health academy where the member is more than 3000 people since 2012 13 we have been taking care of this issue and uh, the academy has created one module called mishal kishor uday and we have conducted this workshop across in the 50 cities of india and secondly uh, we have been doing this in the form of samvad then parent training and then mission skill school uday so these are the ways it has been done in a very uh, big way but whenever an adult is learning we must create some something which is very important in their routine day to day life so i just do one minute crash course on happiness and there are three principles to it the first principle is to slow down slow down is what i mean is to stay in the present moment live life right now because the cerebellum which is given by god has two very important thing which is the cause of our suffering and that is excellent memory of past an amazing sense of imagination so if we live right now in the present moment we are almost happy always the second principle is what you think so you feel so my internal dialogue creates my emotions so if i take care of my internal dialogue what i am communicating with my own self moment by moment i can be happy always and the third principle is attitude of gratitude severe covid all throughout the world pandemic which we have never seen we all have survived we are alive interacting with each other so what we have in our life we should be able to stay happy and live the life with gratitude so let's begin with a small module i would request all the participants to be the works workshop participants with me for next maybe around 7 8 minutes so that you can get that zeal how it will happen when there is a physical workshop happening with around 40 45 people interacting with each other in a workshop setup so we'll be involving everything into this the aim of this next 7 8 minutes is to just find out essential needed for an adolescent clinic and it is in history taking and physical examination effective communication skills and basics of counseling the basic participants of these workshops are those who are practicing pediatrics they want to learn about adolescent health and they want to practice it when they go to their places so that they can increase their work as well as take care of this adolescent in their busy opd practices so this is just a small video showing what is the role of a parent and a pediatrician
so whenever this kind of videos are played the people have uh, attended it very powerfully here just we wanted to show that the god has given us a beautiful child now it is our responsibility as an adult as a parent as a healthcare provider to give the child full potential so that they can develop fully into uh, routinely so they must know about how adolescent friendly when you should be there the front desk staff the healthcare personnel and the most important thing is we must ensure privacy of these adolescent boys and girls the equipment has to be those can be taken care of because pediatricians are well versed with taking care of those small tiny children so that they are not well versed with seeing this adult adolescent patients and we must have various charts available to take care of and when we are taking care of this another important thing is physical examination here the consent is very important according to the indian laws more than 18 years can give consent they can enter into contract express legal uh, uh, written consent uh in this situation and consent not needed if there is medical emergencies the other important thing is confidentiality as this was discussed in the previous things that personal health information should be kept confidential and that has to be informed to the parent as well as to the teenager boys girls but it it cannot be kept confidential if there is a abuse harm to life crime or hospitalization the most important part of this any kind of workshop is a role play here uh, before the workshop has been taken uh, taken up we have assigned a role of a mother a role of a teenager to two of the participants of the workshop and i'll play the uh, the role of a doctor and we created two scenarios the first scenario is in a busy pediatric practice the mother rushes to the hospital bringing this teenager daughter and start complaining about that my girl has started uh, smoking and how she can smoke like this and she is not right one she complains and in that situation the doctor is so busy that he starts uh, judging the child and uh, he start uh, advising the child and start examining the child very fast which is not the right way because whenever there is a, a, a heades uh, screening is to be done it, it it should not be advising to the child or judging to the child the ideally in the busy pediatric practice we cannot do the uh, the heades screening of the history taking as well as the uh, counseling if that is required so it is always better to create another time period where only teenager are been seen so a separate time for adolescent clinic has to be there so whenever this they come back again then there is a heades screening which has been done like the doctor is asking shikha that uh, uh, how is going on i have not been seen you since long so she is telling that uh, not good sir dad moved to dubai for a job last year it has been terrible at home mom is always so busy and cranky so there is issue in the home there is issue at the work she doesn't like to eat home based food she is eating outside food she is uh, gaining weight there is body image issue but the important thing is while this uh, screening head is screening few things which come up very powerful is that she does not want to give away she is very keen to become a computer engineer so the doctor in future during this uh, counseling sessions take care of these things so by this role play we demonstrate what is the wrong way of taking history as well as the counseling the child and the parent and then followed by there is a right way of in interacting with this uh, parent and the teen so that the participants gets the exact right way in which they can definitely work in future very well the key point in this heades screening is privacy confidentiality non judgmental respectful and empathetic attitude non verbal communication active listening and psychosocial history taking now psychosocial history taking is heades home education employment eating activities drugs sexual health safety and suicide uh, as well as depression and there are various heads in which we we take this head history and come out and that uh, we have shown in the ro role plays in a very positive way so all this is very well covered in a simple interactive way so that there are open ended questions and the team and the parent is uh, uh, giving answer in a very positive way now examination is very tricky in this adolescent boys and girls because they need lot of privacy a chaperone has to be there a various uh, physical examination has been done in a very well and during this only we do a small meditation process so that actually those who are participating in this workshop they themselves are parent they might have young children or a teenager boys and girls as well as they can also teach 
when they go to uh, their routine clinic in this meditation with a very uh, light uh, 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 volume we just go through their emotions when the child was born and when they saw the child for the first time and how the connection was how they were feeling about that child the love bonding oneness with that child and the the zeal to take care of their children and whenever these parents are uh, interacting with adolescent boys and girls if they can take care of the presence of love in their attitude with these children definitely they can uh, they can uh, control their uh, ways and means of interacting with them this is very important slide and everyone who, who those who are taking care of adolescent must, must understand there is a differential brain development the part of brain which associated with emotional uh, uh, reward uh, the risk taking behavior mood swings develop at a very early age whereas the prefrontal cortex which is the part which is really taking care of the uh, judgmental what is right and wrong and what is the consequences of my action takes a little more time so all those who are taking care of them should take care of this the most important thing uh, probably the only tool for uh, interacting with teenagers is uh, effective communication and there are teen challenges which every uh, those who are taking care of teen should know about it because they need privacy they are confused about their thoughts and words and they keep things to themselves and they don't find right words to express themselves the communication is verbal non verbal everything is very important whenever we are doing uh, head is screening or counseling with children as well as parents also should know about this privacy as well as how they can do a, a, a proper uh, body language the last and most important thing in taking care of uh, teenager issues is active listening it has been experienced since last almost 10 12 years of working with teenagers and parents that if there is a trustworthy adult who can listen to teens 80% of their issues they are definitely take care of in a very well and then we recite one excellent poem which is showing that the art of listening teenager the poem is showing showing saying that when i ask you to listen to me a teenager is telling it to the parent or the uh, healthcare worker i am not asking for your advice when i ask you to listen to me i am not asking for your explanations when i ask you to listen to me i am not asking you to solve my problems when i ask you to listen to me i am not asking for your judgments when i ask you to listen to me i am asking you to be with me to hear me let me work things out for myself when i ask you to listen to me i am asking you to trust me just few minutes uh to trust me so i can feel free to share with you my feelings my hopes my concerns my questions my confusions me and i in turn will listen to you so this is how they are really telling and there is going to be a one video which i am skipping because it is showing actually the communication between an adult and a teenager uh the definition of you all know counseling is not an advising it is just a driving uh, the teenager towards a proper way and we must use the gather uh, uh, acronym 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 to counsel these children so that they can be taken care of and the most important thing is anticipatory guidance to all the parents about normal development growth positive parenting very essential topic to be discussion in, in this and the adherence issue for the counseling so these are the just contact number with me and then we end with a very small excellent video in that workshop so that that team building develops in a very big way and incredible team work can be worked very well so that the healthcare worker the parents and all other can work very well so that we can be ready for the future so thank you so much for patient hearing and uh, thank you so much for giving this opportunity thank you very much for your presentation dr nishal we appreciate it uh, very much we have a uh, one question here and it says, um, what is the level of interest in learning about adolescent health by pediatricians in India? It is extremely, uh, uh, they are interested in adolescent health because gradually what is happening is that the adolescent issues are really increasing and the post COVID because of many other issues, the adolescent health is becoming very difficult. Parenting in last 10, 12 years has become very difficult. Uh, the other things that we have not been seen, that is substance abuse, the sexuality issues, all these are uh, increasing. 
the gender issues are also increasing in india as well as in the part of which i am uh, uh, working so pediatricians are definitely extremely eager to learn basics about adolescent health adolescent care today also in this workshop there are many pediatricians who are part of this uh, this have joined so that they can learn whatever is going on across the world perfect and and do you have any type of feedback, for example, when you make this type of intervention or role plays with the uh, students or do they give you any type of feedback, how they feel yeah. when they do this role play, all these type of things? Yeah, they are basically very happy because majority of the time, this kind of things, innovations are not used. Usually it is one way uh, communication about any topic that has been taught to them. But whenever there is an interactive things where there is auditory, visual, as well as kinesthetic methods are used to connect with them. So actually, rather than they getting information, they are transformed to take care of these adolescents very well. So whenever it is very helpful in the screening of any issues going on in adolescent health. So whenever adolescent comes for any other cough cold fever, a few questions here and there will definitely give them idea and then they can call them for some history taking as well as counseling sessions. Thank you. And there is here a question from the question and answer that says, uh, how do you train health professionals to educate adolescents and young women who do not have access to supply for adequate menstrual hygiene? Hygiene. See, basically, there is a one program that we are working on is Sakhi Sang Samvad. And that is one program which is going to be uh, going to place, take, take place in the schools where we are going to definitely teach the uh, young girls about the menstrual, menstrual hygiene, menstrual care, use of tampons or use of menstrual cup if that is not there, because these are the things which can be reused after cleaning it properly. So these are the ways. So if a healthcare worker is trained on all these areas, definitely they can communicate in various settings so that thing, the information spreads faster. Thank you very much. I think we don't have more questions. And so we appreciate your presentation very much. And we are on time to go with the next presentation. So thank you, Dr. Nishal. Now we are going to start with our fourth presentation that is called Development of a Board Game to Enhance Understanding of Adolescents Amongst Ad Healthcare Professionals. This presentation will be by Dr. Richard Churchill. He is a retired general practitioner, family doctor from Nottingham, England, co-founder and trustee of the UK Association for Adolescent Health, former associate clinical professor and director of clinical skills at the University of Nottingham Medical School. You can start, Dr. Churchill. Okay, thank you. Let me just share my screen and hopefully people can see that. Um, I am really interested in having heard the other presentations today, how this may well fit in, although it seems something completely different. It is very much building on what we've already heard about um, needing to train a healthcare workforce to understand some of the difficulties of young people have, um, understanding their perspective, as we heard in the patch program earlier, um, really important uh, perspectives there, and having ways of educating uh, healthcare professionals that are interesting and fun. I'm a uh, retired family family doctor, but I've spent many years uh, either running courses or training medical students, um, both in the UK and uh, luckily in, in other countries as well. Um, and uh, I want to share a little bit about my um, interest from that. So uh, we would all agree that there are three components really to developing competence in a healthcare professional. And uh, the first is attitudes and skills and knowledge. And I would argue that if you've got the right attitude um, in, in somebody, then they're actually motivated to learn the skills and knowledge. So attitudes and influencing attitude is core, um, rather than necessarily giving knowledge and skills primarily. And I think there's a level that was one stage before that, and that's actually making people aware that there's an issue. Uh, being aware of your own lack of knowledge, um, being aware of your own lack of skills, being aware there's a problem before you're actually really motivated to learn. 
And I think some of this in relation to adolescent health comes from a bit of a myth. Because we've all been adolescents, haven't we? And therefore, it's obvious, isn't it? That we understand adolescence. It's common sense, they would think. But I always start any presentation by challenging that and suggesting that's a myth. Because I think we have a distorted view of our adolescence. And some of that is because our, bra our brain was developing, as uh, Dr. Nishal pointed out earlier, our brain is developing through adolescence. And I think we develop a bit of a filtered memory. You've probably seen that yourself. There are things we really remember and things we perhaps don't as much. And people sometimes remind us of that we went through it. So, so we've got a distorted memory. The environment young people are growing up now is different to the one that certainly I grew up in, um, however many years ago that was, and certainly uh, however many years, even five years, the environment, the culture is changing constantly. So we know that young people have got different pressures, different stresses. And I think our perspective is also view, uh, affected by people around us, and particularly the media, if ever you look at the media, it often has a very negative perception of y young people. Um, so I, I, I like to challenge this false assumption, and that then influences awareness, which influences attitudes. So why a board game? Why did I think about doing a board game? Well, first of all, I like playing games. Um, I'm not supposed to say that, am I, as a, as a former academic GP? Um, I was once told I wasn't a serious academic, maybe because I like playing board games. Um, but um, I, 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 it's fun to play board games. But actually, when I was a medical student, I do remember that we had somebody brought along a board game about global health. Now, I can't remember the details of the game. I can only vaguely remember some of the messages, but it did change my attitudes. It did influence me. Um, and so I remembered that over many years because really board games can be a form of simulation. OK, we can do role plays and all sorts of things for clinical bits, but it can also be a type of simulation as well. It's a different mode of teaching learning, um, something that can be fun and engaging. It, Board games particularly, and I want to separate this from electronic and online games, but board games particularly involve social interaction. Um, they create a non-threatening environment. We're in a non-real situation. We're in a game situation. You can play all sorts of things. I mean, people play war games, don't they, rightly or wrongly, but they're, they're not being physically threatened by those. Same way we can do uh, go through adolescence in the same way. Um, supports mutual learning. And there is some evidence um, not many studies have been carried out, but there are uh, certainly some studies and um, some uh, reviews that have suggested that certainly they have educational benefits in terms of enhancing knowledge and, and behaviours. So good reasons for thinking about a board game. And how did it happen? How did I start to get involved in doing this? Well, it started with that idea. Surely let's do something that's different. Whenever I run any sort of training program, I want to do something that's slightly different, either controversial or interactive. And so that's where it started. I talked to people. I started with young people I knew, some of my younger patients, uh, with colleagues, and we talked about it. And came up with a, a very early pilot version that was produced on the back of a, a roll of, of wallpaper with sticky labels on it. And we tried this out with some friends and family. My poor family have been th through this and some of my colleagues' families as well have been put through this time and time again. Um, and then we got some input from young people from a college um, to see what they thought. And did it was it re realistic? Did it really get convey messages? And I tried it with some medical students. And uh, around that time, I was also running an annual uh, adolescent health course, a week long adolescent health course, which was slightly unusual and uh, in Bahrain for uh, family medicine uh, residents. Um, and I wanted something to add into that course. It was perhaps slightly different to the routine. Um, and so by a process of iterative improvement, we completed a near final version back in 2020. And then COVID hit. And of course, anything face to face like board games went out the window. So it's been paused to some extent since then, um, but uh, not to the level that I've given up. It's just uh, um, we're now re resurrecting the idea and see where it goes. Let's have a look. Moving on. OK, so the game itself. It's for two to eight players, um, and it really maps out a route from the start of puberty, as we would define adolescence as a start of puberty, until independent adulthood. 
and it's aimed primarily at healthcare providers. These could be medical students, uh, undergraduate or pre-service level. It could be more commonly used amongst GP or family practice uh, trainees. Um, the sort of scoring bit of the game is you collect points through the game. Uh, it has to be a, a competitive element in any game. And these points, very simply, they can represent resilience, tangible assets, they can be money or qualifications or social capital. They're just things you gain throughout, and they're very much interchangeable. And I, I should say that um, you play the game as a young person going through the stages, um, but you're not uh, gender identified um, because that avoids all sorts of in, I, issues. Um, you're, you're actually uh, neutral in, in terms of where you go. All sorts of things can happen to you, which might um, uh, happen to either you if you're male, female or transgender or whatever. But we don't get too much into that. It takes about two hours, but it depends how many people are playing. With big groups of eight, it can take two and a half uh, hours. Uh, with small groups of one or two, an hour, an hour and a half. Um, so let's think about the starting point and just give you a bit of an idea. On I'm just going to talk you through the game and some of the attributes of the game and why I, I like to think it's, it's giving something across. You start by being dealt out some uh, attributes. They're dealt at random, um, just as we are when we're children. We have no control over uh, you know, the family we're uh, put into, our basic intelligence, wealth or health. These things happen to us. And this is where we start the game by giving out these uh, attributes. Let's have a look at random. Okay, so this young person is living with both parents. Uh, unfortunately, they're not very bright. They've got a low IQ, and you'll see you get fewer points for that. You're starting with some points. Um, they're living in a wealthy family, good for them. Um, so some more points there, but they do have some sort of chronic or long-term illness. And so points are attributed, and there are some with life-limiting illness, there are some with uh, poor, there are some people living in care um and and so on so you'll get a mix of these um at random and isn't that real life we start off with what we get um and at each stage in this game it's possible just to stop the game pause the game with the players and say well how realistic do you think that is now the first bit of the board and the board has three stages and I'm going to start with the first bit of the board. And the first bit actually is to throw a six. This is very common to any board game, isn't it? Throw a six to start. Um, and this represents you don't start until the onset of puberty. And sometimes just pause it there and think, well, what triggers puberty? And we can talk about the biological mechanisms of that and the way uh, sometimes it's early, sometimes it's later. And it's really interesting as some uh, players start to get frustrated by not being able to throw a six, while some go straight into it. And you talk about, yeah, that's real life, isn't it? Young people, some of them, if they got delayed puberty for whatever reason, can feel really left behind at this stage. So you feel that in the board game. You then throw the dice and progress around the board. And the aim of this particular part of the board is to collect the four cards. Of course, they will be in particular order in real life, but we're just saying collect a sexual development card, hormone development card, body growth card and brain development card before you can progress. And there's a few cards in between. There's a few spaces, missing turns and moving on so many spaces. But until you've gone around this board, you keep on going around this part of the board until you've got all those four cards. Again, some elements of frustration, some elements of and you can discuss brain development and, and, and body growth and some of these issues as you go on. But once you've got all these cards, we're able to move on to the next stage. But you'll notice there, there's something that's upside down on here, uh, but I'll just highlight it called an education card. So we've got some extra things to, to put on to, to, um, uh, to demonstrate to people. Let's have a look at an education card and see what that means. And this is to introduce, introduce an element of knowledge into the game. And there's a whole series of these. Um, these were designed for a UK audience predominantly, but in actual fact, they've worked quite well in the uh, in the Middle East setting that I used it. Um, uh, and there are about 50 cards, I think, or 60 cards uh, covering these five themes. Um, and let's see if we turn this card over to give you an idea. Well, first of all, it says give this card to another player and get them to read the question to you. And if you get the card right, you get a point, I think. Oh, no, you keep the card. And if you don't, um, then, then return it to the pack. So somebody reads it to you. Um, here we go. Um, in which of the following countries is cyberbullying 
um, of young people reported most of them by parents. Uh, obviously, somebody's reading this to you. Um, and if you didn't know, uh, the answer certainly on the, my sources said it was India. Um, and uh, we can have a, discussion, a little bit of discussion about cyberbullying if necessary. Um, interesting, 1% in Russia. Uh, we can discuss why that might be, but we won't. Um, anyway, let's move on to the next stage of the game. Now, this is a more convoluted route. As young people go through this stage, it's all about the choices and chances they experience. Um, and the first choice, if you move right to the left hand side of this, choose your route, because there's one route that's actually slightly shorter in terms of numbers of squares, but has a lot more of these discs on that are choices and chances. Basically, they're, they're, it's a higher risk route, but shorter. Um, it's not the first person who gets to the end of the game that, that wins. It's the person with the highest number of points. But anyway. OK, so the choices and chances card um, and, and again, some other options as you go through. So you choose your route and then let's have a look at some choices and chances cards because we're moving on. And these are very much aiming to stimulate the players to think about the sorts of things that influence young people, some of which may be their choices, but some of which may be out of their control and outcomes be, can be positive, negative or neutral. And some outcomes can be catastrophic. Try your first cigarette. Well, in this particular, if you do that, you then roll a dice again. If you score a one or a two, you hate it and never again. Three or four, you just enjoy it and occasionally smoke. If five or six, which is about 30%, actually do get straight addicted, um, if I, uh, can't quit. And there's a negative outcome. Quickly going through some others. Um, Party time. OK, if you go out, you enjoy meeting friends, you get three points. Uh, or you may choose to stay at home. Uh, the worst outcome is somebody posts an embarrassing video of you online and uh, again some penalty points so i'm going to jump through these uh to this one dangerous driving if you get this card if you've got a driving license and some of the cards are driving license you lose it if you haven't you roll the dice you score a one or two you get away with it three or four you get caught and charged with some uh five you get seriously injured somebody number six you are killed and your game is over now i remember playing this with a group and the person who got that was devastated and i said yeah that reflects real life or death and it actually had a real impact just getting that card it was only a game but anyway let's move on um final stage of the car uh, the game because time is nearly running out. Um, the final stage is a bit like uh, early adulthood because the the uh, goal is to acquire a job, a relationship and accommodation. Now, of course, you don't need all these in this day and age. You certainly don't get all of these to be independent adulthood. But we're doing a game. And so you go around the board, you can land on squares that allow you to have a job offer which you may have enough points to acquire accommodation. You have to buy it with your points and a relationship, which comes free, uh, but with difficulty sometimes. And of course, you'll see there, there's a possibility of a relationship breakdown. You lose that card. So you have to have all three cards and you get to the end of the game. Right. Now, the main thing of this, of course, it's fun and people like playing it. But the main thing... Uh, educationally is you pause it throughout the game and discuss what's going on and you can come up with the things I've already suggested but at the end of the game how many points did you get how does that relate to what you started with what extent do you think it reflects real life um, is it right is it wrong use that as a discussion point I'm not saying this game really reflects adolescence accurately but the fact it doesn't can be a discussion point in itself what insights has a game given you? What are the main things you've learned? How might playing the game affect you, the way you manage adolescence in the future? We haven't evaluated it yet, not formally. It's been successfully piloted amongst a whole range of people. And uh, when I was running regularly over uh, six or seven years, uh, a one week course on adolescent health and family practice residency program in Bahrain, it was repeatedly voted as the most popular part of the course. Now, that, of course, could mean that the rest of the course wasn't so good, but we won't go there. We think it was a very popular part of the course with lots of learning going on. So in summary, because Mauricio has appeared on the screen and I know I need to finish. Um, board games can be used to complement more traditional methods of teaching. Uh, they're interactive, they stimulate conversation and create this safe space for talking about things. Um, all educational games have their limitations, but you can discuss those as part of the learning from it. Um, and there's some negatives. They're hard to produce. 
uh, as you say, in the time it's consuming, challenging, and uh, we're thinking now of producing on a, on a bigger scale, that's going to be much harder. But I do think what's been important in developing this game was to get multiple stakeholders uh, involved in its planning and, its, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, design and, and this iterative approach to improve it. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Uh, it was a very nice uh, presentation and games are very attractive <laughs> for, for doing all these type of works with adolescents. And so uh, here we have one question and uh, if, you, if you would be so kind to answer. Um, great board game, <laughs> it says, it is possible to buy it or find it, uh, its description on internet. Not currently, no. It's it's um, sitting in my cupboard at the moment. Uh, three, we have three um, uh, copies of it at the moment. We're going to look into producing more. Um, and if you email me, and my details are on the program, which hopefully you've got, I'd be very happy to email me. And as it becomes more available, very happy to uh, send you more details as well. That is very nice and very interesting. And perhaps um, it is interesting to think to like adaptate, you know, uh, like the questions to the ethnic or the, the you know, like the idiosyncrasy of the places. Uh, it's a very, yeah. very good thing. An interesting, an interesting point there, just to pick up. I was concerned when I took it to uh, Bahrain to, to run there that it was too UK focused and that might be a problem. Mm -hmm. So what I mm -hmm. produced was some blank cards that actually the, uh, the the residents themselves could come up with some ideas of their own um, to actually use um, uh, to actually use as part of the game, and we actually subsequently incorporated some of those ideas into the into the main game. So actually, it's another way of making sure it's much more co culturally appropriate. Uh, but there are the challenges of transferring. Uh, across different cultures as well. The other thing just to mention is young people themselves love playing it and it may have a benefit to them. I know we're talking about educating health professionals today, but uh, we've been talking uh, uh, to uh, some educators, some teachers may well be interested in this to get discussions going as well. Um, so I think it's got potential. Thank you. I don't know if we have more questions. I think not. Um... I'm just checking here. Okay, no. Oh, here. Uh, oh. Another question. EBT, uh, digitally, is, is it producing it? Uh, so, okay. so as to be like more accessible? Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, I made the point earlier that I, I was, my interest in it is, is as a physical face-to-face -face board game because I believe that so much education works better. But then I'm old fashioned. Um, and and I don't know whether it's possible to get the same educational benefits um, with uh, with an electronic version. That's up for debate, and maybe that's for somebody else to take <laughs> on board. <laughs> An application for the future, perhaps. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, very much, Dr. Churchill. Um, now uh, finishing uh, this symposium, this is this was the second session. I would like to thank to all the speakers and of course the attendees and all the facilitators that uh, make this event uh, work for everyone. Uh, I would like to, to say that, uh, to remark that it is very important to be all together here discussing about education in adolescent health, as it is very important and we need to know what is going on in all the countries and all the experiences that help us for our working in our regions. Uh, or to keep and to take some ideas uh, to go on working in our regions. So the, uh, the, the presentations were excellent. And uh, you have to be in touch because this is the second session and we still have two sessions more. So you can, you can uh, also subscribe and get the link to go for the future uh, events that are going to be held in the 15th, November the 15th. Uh, 
uh, of course, you have our contacts and the people that uh, the speakers that were presenting. Uh, you have also the contacts in the in the PDF, uh, so that uh, if you need to keep in touch, uh, you can ask for more questions. Um, we are also inviting you to put some expressions of interest of future um, of future sessions in the link that we are sending you um, uh, on the WhatsApp, on the WhatsApp, sorry, on the on the chat. And if you have like more ideas for innovation, it would be like to be considered for in, uh, to include in our future events. So you have the form and you can you can also write it there. Um, thank you very much everyone for being here. We close this session and we will see each each of you in November 15th. Thank you very much. Bye bye.